Amen. Yeah, sometimes, John, we just got to surrender to that. I finally had to do the same thing, and now, now it, I have to wear them even more often. So a lot of times you see me leave my glasses on. It's because I'm tired of taking them on and off. I just kind of, I just leave them on. You, you all are blurry for a little bit, but that's okay. <laughs> How many of you are old enough to remember, for me, one of the most irritating commercials? And it was a, I can't even remember, it was a shampoo commercial. But ever since I was like 12 or 10 or whatever, I remember this commercial. She'll tell two friends. And he'll tell two friends, and so on, and so on, and so on. Show of hands, even if you're at home, how many of you remember that? It still drives me, that, that, that commercial hasn't been on for 30 years, and somehow I still remember that. And uh, so I didn't understand why this came to mind, but uh, it really fits, as irritating as that commercial is, it really fits what we're going to talk about today. The title of the sermon is Outline for Impact. And as I was studying for the sermon this week, I realized that, that Paul, in this short section, gives us an outline to impact the world for Christ. And then it dawned on me that that, that, that commercial, as irritating as it is, might actually be on to something. And this is something we've heard for over 2,000 years. Is that when we give the gospel away to somebody, when we share Christ with somebody, they then are called to do the same thing. That's why you and I are here today, whether you're online or you're here in person. If you're a follower of Christ today, it's because somebody spoke to you about Jesus. Someone, somewhere, at some time, obeyed the call of God and shared the gospel with you. Now, maybe you came to Christ on the first time you were told. Maybe you had to work through some things and it was a gradual process. But you're not here today by accident. However, the gospel was proclaimed to you. You believed it. Even if you struggled with it. Even if you weren't sure about it. And there's nothing wrong with questions. In fact, it oftentimes is a person who is really seeking the truth, who's asking questions. And Jesus was never afraid of questions, and neither is the Bible. Questions are good. That's how we learn. Now, last week... We went from the family code, and then all of a sudden hit the brakes, and Paul begins to turn the tide, and, and he sets in this short little passage this need that he has for prayer. And I don't know if he designed it this way or not, but he's given us an easily followed outline to impact our family, friends, and our community for Christ. So I'm going to reread this passage and work our way through it, and then we'll go back to Acts, and I'll explain why that pertains to Colossians. It's just a few verses, Colossians 4, 2 through 6. Paul says, continue steadfastly in prayer. That's the first point. Being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And if you remember, as we've been working through Colossians, Thanksgiving has been one of the themes that has run through this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. Thankfulness and thanksgiving. At the same time, prayer, there it is again. So prayer and pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. That I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious. Let your speech always be gracious. 
seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So we're called to discernment, so we know how to answer each person. So I'm going to go through the rest of this outline, and then we'll unpack this passage. So we have prayer and continue to pray for ministry with thanksgiving. Pray for individuals that God may open the door for them. So if you're praying for people who, to share the gospel, like Paul saying, pray for me. So if you know people who have an evangel evangelistic heart, you know missionaries, pray for them that God might open the door for the gospel where they're at. And if not, pray for yourself that God might use you to share the gospel with somebody. Number five. Gracious and salty speech. Now, not salty in how we would think of salty. But salty so that people, you know what it's like if you have salt, you have too much salt, you get thirsty. Our speech is to be gracious and salty for the unbeliever. So that they're drawn, so that they become thirsty to know this Jesus that we know. And learn to walk in wisdom towards those outside the faith. We were once outside the faith. We were once op opposing to Jesus. We, at one time, wanted nothing to do with him. But somebody came to us with gracious, salty speech or gracious, salty actions we said, I believe it. Verse 3, at the same time, pray for us that God may open a door for us to the world to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. Yesterday, uh, the men's group met, and uh, we've been working our way through Ephesians. And Paul, uh, we, we were talking about putting on the armor of God. And someone had said, Paul would have known the armor of God, or the, the armor of the Roman soldier, up close and personal, because he was in prison many times. In Colossians, he's saying, I've been in prison for preaching the gospel. But the Apostle Paul never gave up. In fact, as he is in prison, he is still seeking a way to share Christ. I wonder how many Roman soldiers were saved or trusted Christ as Savior because of Paul's faithful witness of proclaiming the mysteries of Christ. He understood the difficulty. Sharing Christ today is no more difficult than it was for Paul. I know sometimes it becomes uncomfortable and sometimes we feel people don't want to hear what we have to say about Jesus. Or we feel we're not trained enough. Or we're not evangelists. Some people are gifted with the gift of evangelism. But all of us have been given a story of how Christ rescued us. No one can take that away from you. And so Paul, in prison, for preaching the gospel, is asking the church that's not in chains to pray for him so that he might be able to speak well the mysteries of Christ so that those on the outside would understand. Paul says in another area that he wants to be all things to all people. He didn't say, I'm going to do everything everybody does. But Paul wanted to be relevant to everybody he came in contact with. Now I'm not sure how you become relevant or all things to a Roman soldier. But by asking for the church to pray, Paul was putting his faith, his hope, and his trust that God would move in a mighty way. Whether he was in prison or outside of prison. That there was this steadfast trust in prayer that God will listen and God will move. 
Verse 4, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. When we speak on Christ's behalf, let us speak clearly. Let us be unashamed and unafraid to share what Christ has done for us, to be witnesses for Christ. And I know it would be easy for us to say, well, you know, um, our culture really doesn't seem to care about the Bible or Jesus. I just heard a statistic last night that 33% of high school age students in America still attend church. 33% out of the whole country, not 33% Kendall County, but out of all the high school students in the nation, only 33% of them actually attend some type of worship service. And so we might say, nobody wants to hear it. Some people might be offended. If they're offended at the word, that's fine. Let us not be, what Paul is saying, let us not be the one that's offensive. People were offended by the word of Jesus when he spoke it. But they couldn't deny his goodness. That's why we get to this, verse 5. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer each person. Peter tells us that we're to be prepared to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. So you might want to practice and ask yourself, why do I have hope? If someone were to ask me, why do I follow Jesus? Why do I bother getting out of bed Sunday morning? What would I say? What would I have to give them? It is crucial for followers of Christ to be able to articulate what they believe and why. Not so we can argue with people, not so we can berate people, but so we have a legitimate answer for the hope that lies within us. Our flannel graph Sunday school stories are not going to work when we're telling people who are unsure or don't want to hear the gospel. We must have gracious, salty speech. And if people want to dis disregard what we have to say, that's fine. But we need to be prepared to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. I think the other key part for this is to walk in wisdom. Walk in wisdom and discernment. Praying that when God gives us this opportunity to proclaim the mystery of Christ, like Paul's talking about, that he tells us on how to share with the person that we're in front of. Because every single person is different. Amen? Amen? We hear different. We receive different. The ways of evangelism and the things we did 50 years ago quit working 30 years ago. Sharing Christ is completely different than it was in the 50s and 60s. When all we had to do was just open the church door and people came. But now, we've been called for a number of years. Nothing wrong with gathering here Sunday morning. In fact, this is great. But after Sunday morning, what are we doing with the word of God and the gift of our salvation? Do we leave it here? Or do we take it with us so that we, with discernment, Wisdom, gracious speech, and saltiness. Share it. So that we're actually being a part of building the kingdom of Christ here, today. The other reading came from Acts 17, verse 22 through 31. This is Paul in the middle of, a, of Athens, where they were steeped in rhetoric speech, and learning. That's what they did for fun. They, they dug into philosophy. They, they had deep thinkers. 
They would debate, they would talk, they would share, they would teach. And they were open to, to new teachings. And so to make sure that, that they covered all their bases, they had some sort of statue for all sorts of gods, including the unknown God. Just in case there was some other God out there that they didn't know about and they didn't want to offend this, this, this God. So they, so they had an altar for the unknown God. These were people who did not buy and do following Yahweh, the King of kings and Lord of lords. They were not interested in Jesus. And here's Paul strolling into Athens. Remember Paul, the brilliant Pharisee, the persecutor of Christians, the one who got knocked off his feet with a lightning bolt, is now in the heart of the beast, prepared to take on these philosophers. Verse 22, so Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, this was the area, like an arena, where, where they would gather, and they would sit around, and the person in the middle would speak, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For our, as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Nor, does he, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on, uh, to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and to the boundaries of their dwelling places. He's saying here that God's the ultimate creator. He set boundaries. He's created. He is sovereign. He's in control. That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. How many of you felt like that? Like you were kind of groping in the dark. You are feeling your way toward God. This whole Jesus thing was a little uncomfortable and weird. And, uh, and maybe you didn't have a whiz-bang moment. That's actually uh, a, a Greek term. No. Uh, but this really, this really exciting explosion moment when, ah, I got it. Or maybe you're kind of like, ah, I just, uh, I don't know the date and the time when I, when I trusted Christ, but, but I know I believe Jesus is my Savior. I've trusted him for his work. I've kind of groped and felt my way around. I know some of us are like that. Yet he is actually not far from each of us. For, quote, in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, quote, for indeed we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone or an image formed by the art of the Im Im imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked but now he commends all people everywhere to repent. So here's Paul's thing. Just like he's telling us to do in Colossians, he did in Acts. What did he do? He immediately befriended them and said, look, you guys all seem religious. He brings the tone down. Gracious speech. He said, look, I want to help you out. Uh, you guys are so religious that, that you set up an altar to an unknown God. I want to tell you about this unknown God. Let me explain him to you. He's the creator of heaven and earth. He's the one that spoke life into man. He created man out of dust and spoke life into him. He set boundaries for waters, for mountains, for land, for people. He's the Lord of heaven. He's not made of stone or gold or silver. He's an actual living being that has intimate interaction with his creation, that loves his people. And then Paul says, look, even your own poets talked about him. 
And they said that indeed, in him we, we move and have our being. You see how Paul connected with them? You see how he, he had gracious speech. He had wisdom when he walked into the Areopagus. He didn't show up saying, y'all are going to burn. Look, if you don't trust Christ, it's over. He walked in there with a respectful tone, in a respectful manner, acknowledged where they were, and then acknowledged the greatness of God and allowed them to make the decision on their own. In fact, when you read the rest of that, some were angry and some were like, hey, we're going to ask him to come back. Oh, I want to hear more about this, this Jesus that he's talking about. It's an incredible illustration of this outline that God has called us to. You want a, an outline for impact? Seek God's wisdom. Walk in his direction. Have gracious, salty speech. Be tender-hearted. And engage people where they're at. Remembering we were in the same place at some time. Let's pray. Uh, Lord Jesus, uh, thank you for this gift of your word. And thank you that we, when we get discouraged or we share our faith, and then people don't want to have anything to do with it, we have this great hope that the Holy Spirit's going to bring this together all in one moment. And then it doesn't happen. Lord, when we're in those moments, let us not be discouraged. And let us be reminded that we might not have believed the first time we heard either. In fact, Lord, we know it's only by the Holy Spirit. Because in our flesh, we know it's crazy to think that we could speak to somebody we can't see, hear from somebody that we don't know how we're going to communicate with, someone we can't touch, can't hear, and yet, you still communicate with us. You still use us. So when we're discouraged, or when we failed, and you've called us to speak and we didn't, forgive us, dust us off, and send us back out into ministry for your name's sake. We ask you, Father, in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Amen.